The Rosicrucian movement is a mystical fraternity which, by necessity, operated in secret for much of its existence. It claims that its roots originated in ancient Egypt from the time of Pharaoh Tutmos III, who organized the first esoteric school of initiates founded upon principles similar to those perpetuated today. Some modern researchers, however, assume that the Rosicrucian movement originated with a group of German Protestants between 1607 and 1616, when three anonymous documents were published in Europe. They were called Fama Fraternitatis, Rose Cruscus, Confessio Fraternitatis, and Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, Anno 1459. When a portion of the body is wounded, it is found that the tissues, lymphatic and blood vessels, glands, muscles, nerves, and sometimes even the bone are severed. The alarm is sounded by the nervous system and the repair cells rush to the spot in great numbers. The flowing blood washes away the dirt and foreign substances, or at least endeavors to do so. Then the blood coagulates and forms a scab to protect the wound. By this time, millions of blood cells have arrived on the scene and the repair work begins at once. The cells display the most wonderful activity and intelligence in this work. The cells of the tissues, nerves, blood vessels, etc. on each side of the wound began to reproduce themselves very rapidly and gradually form a bridge over the space between the two sides of the wound, bridging each side together. In this bridge work, they display intelligence, purpose and system. The cells of the blood vessels connect with the same kind of cells on the opposite side of the wound, forming new tubes through which the blood may flow. The cells of the connective tissues do likewise, and so do the cells of each of the other kinds of bodily substance. Then after the inside work is complete, new epidermis cells form a new skin over the healed wound. The above gives you but a passing glimpse of the wonderful intelligent work of the cells in performing their offices in the body. What has not been told is equally as wonderful. To all intents and purposes, the cells of the body are like the individual bees in the hive, that is, intelligent, independent living creatures working together for the common good. The above digression was made in order to acquaint you with the wonderful intelligence which is possible of manifestation by the counterparts of the monera and the amoebae, those lowly forms of one cell life which we have been considering on the preceding pages. An understanding of the facts above related will bring home to each student the full perception and appreciation of the truth of the statement previously made, that each living creature, from highest to lowest, is endowed with a degree of consciousness and intelligence proportionate to its requirements in its life, work and activities. Some of the amoebae, the diatoms for instance, secrete solid matter from the water and build themselves tiny houses or shells to protect themselves from their enemies. These shells have tiny openings through which the creature may project its false feet for purpose of movement and for securing food. The skeletons of these minute creatures form the deposits of chalk found in many parts of the world. Next higher in the scale come the infusoria, which are distinguished by having tiny vibrating filaments or thread-like appendages, which they employ for purposes of motion and grasping their food. These filaments are permanent and are the beginning of the manifestation of permanent limbs in the animal world. These elementary creatures have also evolved rudimentary mouth openings and also a short gullet which is a rudimentary throat, windpipe and food passage. Then come the sponges, slimy creatures employing a spongy, soft skeleton, the latter being what we commonly call sponges. This creature also employs whip-like filaments with which to gather its food. Then come the polyps, which fasten themselves to floating objects mouth downward with tentacles serving to seize their food. The jellyfishes, which belong to this family, also have rudimentary muscles, the contraction of which enables the creature to swim. They also possess a rudimentary nervous system and rudimentary eyes and ears. Next in the ascending scale come the starfish, sea urchin and their kind, some of which possess a well-defined nervous system, a true stomach and eyes. Then come the annulosa or jointed creatures comprising the various families of worms, crabs, spiders 
ants, etc. This great family of creatures comprises nearly four-fifths of the known life forms of the animal kingdom. Their bodies are well formed and they have quite well developed nervous systems, eyes and other sense organs and in some of the higher forms a circulatory system distribution of fluid akin to blood which distributes the blood and oxygen to all parts of the body of the creature. Highest in the scale of this great family are the insects with their many varieties the characteristics of which need not be described here all being familiar with them. The wonders of spider life of ant life, of bee life, have been depicted by great naturalists and the student will need no additional assurance of the presence of intelligence within the being of these tiny creatures and their relations in the insect world. Darwin once said that the brain of the ant, although not much larger than a pinpoint, is one of the most marvelous atoms of matter in the world, perhaps more so than the brain of man. Then come the mollusca, which group include the oyster, clam, snail, etc. Some of the higher forms of this family show signs of a rudimentary vertebra and may be considered as possibly the connecting link between the invertebrates and vertebrates. Next in the ascending scale come the vertebrates, so called by reason of the presence in them of a vertebra or spinal column or backbone and an internal skeleton as contrasted with the external skeleton of the lower forms of life. At the lowest end of the scale of the vertebrates are found the great family of fishes with high and low species. Then come the reptiles with its species of snakes, lizards, turtles, crocodiles, etc. There are many connecting links between the family of fishes and that of the reptiles and also many between the family of reptiles and the family of birds which is next highest in the scale. Among the birds, particularly in the crow family, we find examples of a high degree of intelligence. Next above the birds come the mammals which is connected with the family of birds by several strange connecting links. For instance, the Australian duckbill, which a strange creature lays eggs and then when her eggs are hatched, nourishes them with milk from her breast. In the great family of mammals are the following subfamilies of animals, namely the monotremes or half-bird, half-mammal creatures, the marsupials or milk-giving, pouched animals which carry their imperfectly developed young in an extended pouch until maturity such as the opossum and kangaroo. The placentals or creatures having the placenta or appendage through which the young is nourished in the womb before birth. That is the royal line through which the higher forms of the mammals proceeded. Among the placentals are found the following subfamilies, the edentata or toothless creatures such as the sloths, armadillos, etc. The sirena or sea cows, manatees, dugongs, etc the cetacea or whales, dolphins, porpoises, etc., which resemble fishes but which are true mammals bringing forth matured young which are nourished at the breast, the ungluta or hoofed animals such as the horse, the cow, the rhinoceros and hippopotamus, the pig, the camel, the deer, the sheep, etc., the hyracoidea, the family of the coney, rock, rabbit, etc., the proboscidea or trunked animals such as the elephant, the rodentia or gnaws, including the rat, the hare, the beaver, the squirrel, the mouse, etc. The chiroptera or wing-fingered animals, including the great families of bats, etc. The lemurodia or lemur family, the individuals of which resemble a monkey in general appearance, but have in addition a long bushy tail and a sharp muzzle, like a fox. They are like a small fox having hands and feet like a monkey. The primates or family of creatures like the monkey, baboon, man-apes, gibbons, gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutan, and finally the connecting links between the apish forms and man. In this ascending scale of animal life, the student will perceive countless varieties and species, subspecies, and variations among species and in each there will be perceived some slight difference in the degree and quality of the intelligence manifested by the creature. Even among the individuals of the same species there is found a great variation in such manifestations. But throughout it all there is perceived to be a certain general plane of consciousness which may be called the animal plane as distinguished from the mineral plane on the one hand, the human plane on the other hand. 
the plane of the human. Passing from the plane of animal consciousness to that of the plane of human consciousness, we soon become cognizant of the presence of a new element of consciousness. This element is known as self-consciousness, or the consciousness which enables man to say, knowingly, of himself, I am I, to identify himself as the thinker, apart from the thoughts, the actor, apart from the action, the feeler, apart from the feelings, the willer, apart from the voluntary activities, the conscious subject, apart from the phenomena of the senses. It is true that in the primitive forms of human life, this new consciousness exists, but as a faint dawn, but it is latent there, and as the ascent of man progresses, this new conscious flames out in higher and still higher forms. What this new element of self-consciousness is, we shall see presently. In thinking of man, we must remember that primitive human beings, little removed from the apes, are as much man as is the highest individual of the race today, or as will be his still higher descendant of tomorrow. And we must not forget that the plane of human consciousness is closely linked to and blended with the plane of animal consciousness at one of its sides. Huxley has shown us that the brain structure of man as compared with the chimpanzee shows differences but slight as compared to the differences between that of the chimpanzee and that of the lemur. He also shows us that in the important feature of the deeper brain furrows and intricate convolutions, the chasm between the highest civilized man and the lowest human is far greater than between the lowest human and the highest man-ape. We appreciate your friendly company for today's episode of Between Master and Disciples. Planet Earth, Our Loving Home is up next after Noteworthy News. Please stay tuned to Supreme Master Television. May your life be filled with joyousness and loving kindness. For more details, please visit www.suprememastertv.com forward slash BMD.